Luke chapter 4, beginning here in verse 16, is talking about Jesus. It says, so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Look at your neighbor and tell him you are anointed. He says, he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty all those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. But this is the part I like, verse 20. It says, then he closed the book. Then he closed the book. This morning, for the next few moments, I just want to speak a simple message to you entitled, A Man with a Message. How many of you have a message from God? Amen. Give your neighbor a high five and you may be seated this morning. Praise God. A man with a message. But how many know women have a message from God too? I want to talk to you about this message that God has given us as his people. In Luke chapter 4, we really get a clear view of Jesus' mission. And how many know it's a beautiful and amazing mission? It was then, and how many know that mission still is amazing? It still is powerful. To give you a little bit of context about this scripture, Jesus had just been tempted in the wilderness for 40 days and for 40 nights. And during that time of tempting, how many know the enemy visited him and tried to get him to disqualify himself from God's plan for him to go to the cross of Calvary? But how many know Jesus prevailed? And it was through that 40 day wilderness test that now Jesus goes back to his hometown of Nazareth where it all started and he walks into the temple. And the scribes and the priests were amazed at not only that Jesus walked in, but how he was handed the book and they were amazed by the scripture in which he read, found right out of the book of Isaiah chapter 61. And the first scripture that Jesus proclaimed as a minister, now he wasn't ordained by man, but how many know he was ordained by God? And as a minister, the first scripture that Jesus read, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me. And I'll tell you, if, if you want to be a minister, make sure you get the anointing first. Come on, somebody. If you want to preach this gospel of power, make sure you do it with an anointing. That's the very first scripture that Jesus read. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. And how many know the father surely did anoint him? That when Jesus was baptized in water, how many know the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove? So we see that Jesus received the anointing from heaven. But how many are grateful that he didn't keep the anointing to himself? God bless five of you. Give me a little energy this morning. You're not more tired than me. Come on, somebody. How many are grateful that he didn't keep that anointing for himself? How many know he's given us that anointing as well? But how many know that he doesn't give us the anointing just so that we can be blessed in these four walls? How many know that with the anointing comes a powerful purpose, a powerful why? I have come to discover that people will not do the what until they understand the why. Church, do you understand the why? Do you understand the why of the Holy Spirit? See, you and I have received the power from heaven for a meaningful purpose, not for ourselves. But how many know our purpose is for God? I, I came to tell you this morning that God's power isn't for status. But how many know his power is for service? He gives us his power and he anoints us so that we can serve others. He gives us his power and his anointing so that we can begin to go out and serve the people that God has called us to serve. So understand the why. Someone say why. 
Now, what was Jesus's purpose? I think it's going to tell you what the why is. I want to give you a few things. What was what was Jesus's purpose? Why did he receive the anointing? Well, number one, Jesus received the anointing to preach good news to the poor. That's what it said right there in the scripture, didn't it? See, we know this. We know that Jesus has the answer to people's poverty. We, we know that Jesus has the answer to people's poverty. No, ma no matter what that poverty might be, how many know Jesus has exactly what we need? Jesus has what the people need, whether they have finances or they don't have finances. Jesus has what they need. See, Jesus addresses our spiritual poverty. And I think that's important. Sometimes we think of it as financial poverty. But when Jesus sees us, it's more of a spiritual poverty. In the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 3, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the earth. The word poor in the dictionary means to be thin, means to be oppressed, means to be defenseless, means to be afflicted, means, means, to, means to be needy. It means to be weak or in a weak state. And it also means to be socially inferior. So what is the good news of this message? Listen, Jesus gave his life for us when we were the most poor. Come on, somebody. He gave his life for us when we were the most poor. Jesus isn't looking for the rich or the people that have it all together. He's looking for the people that are broken in spirit. Come on, say amen. He's looking for the people who are broken in spirit. I thank God that when he found me, he didn't find me at my strongest. He found me at my weakest. He found us when we were most oppressed, oppressed by the system, oppressed by our family. He found us when we were the most defenseless, when we had no one to come to our aid. How many know it was Jesus who came to our aid? I think we ought to get grateful this morning. It was Jesus that came to our aid. He found me and he took me from being weak to strong. Today, each and every one of us, because of Jesus and because of the anointing that he has given us, we are stronger than we have ever been. We are more full than we have ever been. We don't walk with our head down. We walk with our head up knowing that if God be for us, who could be against us? Can I get a church to shout on it? We're strong because he loved us before anybody else loved us. He loved us when our family rejected us. He loved us when our friends pushed us off the scene. He loved us when they wouldn't hire us. He loved us when no one would give us the time of day. He said, I've come for the broken. I've come for the broken, poor in spirit. He says, and they're going to inherit the earth. So how many know we've got a why? He's anointed us to preach this good news. Not just to the financially poor, but to People who are poor in spirit. The second thing we see about Jesus' purpose is that he came to preach and to restore sight to the blind. We see many examples of that in, in, in his ministry, don't we? When he went from town and village, right? He restored the physical sight. But how many know that Jesus didn't just come to restore physical sight? He came to restore spiritual sight. He came to restore the sight of people who cannot see. He wants us to be able to see again. He says, if my people are going to achieve my plan and get to the place I've called them to be, they need the ability to see. My question, church, can you see? Can, can you see what God desires to do in and through your life? See, why does Jesus restore our sight? Because how many know life can be dark? How many know the more life you live, maybe young people may not understand this, but the older I've gotten, I realize that the darker life can become. Life presents a darkness through its challenges and through its obstacles. And Jesus says, no matter what you go through, I'm going to give you the vision to navigate those problems. That's a good point. He says, I'm going to give you the navigate those stormy seas. I'm going to give you the vision to navigate when those storms begin to rise within your life. See, Jesus came so that blind people might be able to see clearly where others cannot see. It was Jesus who restored our vision. It was Jesus who restored my vision. It was Jesus who restored your vision. See, he gives us the sight to navigate 
where generations before us couldn't navigate where our parents couldn't navigate, where our grandparents couldn't navigate because of generational curses. They couldn't make it through the storm. They couldn't make it through the problems. They, they buckled in times of trial. They buckled in times of testing. But how many know Jesus says, I'm going to give you your sight, and you're going to go places your family members have never been. You're going to go places that people from your past have never been. And guess what? Once you get through, you're going to bring them through as well. Come on and get excited because he's given us our vision back. In, in one story, Jesus found some, a blind man, and he desired to be healed. He needed his vision to be healed, and the Lord, you know, took some mud, and he spit on it, and he made a clay, and he put it on his eyes. And he asked the man, what do you see? That's a powerful, powerful, powerful question. That's a powerful question, not only for sinners, but it's a powerful question for believers, because there's so many believers in the house of God who could see at one time but could no longer see. And he asked the man, he said, he said, what do you see? Look at your neighbor and ask him, what do you see? And listen to what the man said. The man said, I, I, I see men moving like trees. Now, how does a blind man know what men look like if he's never seen? So how many know this was a man who at one time could see, but he had lost his sight? And how many know in the story Jesus touched him again. He touched him a second time. And, and there could be some people here this morning that you initially had the touch, but you lost it. You initially had the anointing, but you lost it. You were moving in the spirit. You were moving in vision, but you lost it. But don't, don't worry. Jesus is able to touch you again this morning. Jesus can give you your sight back. See, Jesus wants to give his people their sight back. Right now, it looks like shadows, but Jesus says, I'm going to make that blurry vision clear again within your life. He came to give us back our sight. See, Jesus came so that we could see a great future for our lives. So we could see a great future for our marriage, for our family, for our children, for the generations to come. Who agrees with the pastor this morning? He wants us to see that plan very clearly, without doubt, without shadow, without Things standing in the way. He says, I want to give you your sight back. That's my mission. Because I have a wonderful plan for you. When we were in Ohio, you heard some of the testimonies. I, I learned so much on this trip. This was a, an amazing trip from the moment we got there to the moment we left. Even on the Uber in, I'm talking to the Uber driver about the Lord and about the need in Ohio. And he's telling me all the different problems and the different issues out there. And being in Ohio, we, we heard the three cries. We, we heard the cry of the street. On that last day, we went right into East Dayton, and we stood right there on the corner. And that's what we did. We stood on the corner. We were planning just to kind of go for a little while. We ended up staying there over two hours. We never moved a muscle. We stood in that same parking lot on the corner. And five minutes standing there, police are driving up. People are walking by, guys that are hooked on drugs. And we start to witness to them and give them the book. We got the attention of that area. In fact, the people who were working in Rite Aid, right across the street, they came out of the Rite Aid and they started taking pictures of us. Now, I thought they were taking pictures of us because they never saw Mexicans in Ohio before, <laughs> which might have been partially true. But I, we know it wasn't that. They saw men who were willing to pray for people to get their sight back. They saw men who were well-dressed. We, we, we were cleaner than the Board of Health. What are these men doing in our city? What are these men standing on this corner? They're praying for people. They're believing for miracles in the lives of these men and women. We heard the cry of the street. We heard the cry of the family. I mentioned to you how the very first place we visited we heard how his daughter had hung herself because she said there's no hope. And the truth is Dayton is running out of hope. Dayton is the third largest city in Ohio. Or the, it's one of the smallest cities in Ohio. It's not one of the largest, like the third large, smallest city, third largest city, about 150,000 people. But in that city, they have 22 methadone clinics. While Columbus, being the largest city in Ohio, has two methadone clinics. 
And Cincinnati has two methadone clinics just 40 minutes away. But in that city, 22 methadone clinics. We heard the cry of the street, but we also heard the cry of the family. Every house we went to, and I'm not exaggerating, probably 90% of the houses we went to, we'd go into that house, and there was a Bible by the bed, and there was a bookshelf full of Christian books, Christian tapes, real good ones. I mean, I, I was tempted to steal a couple of them. <laughs> but I've been changed, y'all. <laughs> and I kept telling, look at these Bibles, look at these Christian books. One of the houses we went into, right, Johnny, right, Isaac, I, I, we were walking through there, and, and I said, this has to be the home of a pastor. I mean, he had so many books and, and so many tapes. I said, this has got to be the home of a pastor. One of the last houses we saw on the day before, on the day before we came home, it, it was a house that was converted into a store, and the woman, beautiful house that we could use, three levels, beautiful home, plenty of room on two acres, and they had converted into like a home goods where they had you know, frames and all kinds of beautiful things for your home. And these women were running it, and they were running their business while we went through. And the realtor was telling, telling her, they said, what do they want to do with this house? And they said, they want to reach drug addicts and their families. And the owner said this. She said, that's beautiful. She said, you know why we're selling this house? He said, why? It's because my husband just retired from 20 years of ministry. Wow. And we're going to rent an RV, and we're going to preach all over the country. This house is going into good hands. Why do I say all that? Because it's when the people of God begin to pray. It's no coincidence that Pastor Sonny woke up one night in the middle of the night and he couldn't sleep and he felt burden in his heart. And I remember being there that next morning and saying, you know, I, I feel like we need to go into the East Coast, but we got to go in different. We can't go in with the church. It, it, you know, I couldn't sleep. I felt the burden. And, and we got to go in. We just got to reach drug addicts. We got to just reach their families. We just got to do it the way we started Victory Outreach. We don't need a church. We just need homes. And you know why that happens is because when God hears the prayers of the families and God hears the prayers of the people, he always looks for a man or a woman to begin to rise up and go in and meet that need. I thank God for a pastor that's sensitive to the cry of God's people. He has anointed us because he's given us a purpose. We heard the cry of the city. The first day, they put us on the phone with the chief of the police. And he says, here, talk to him, the chief of Dayton. And I begin to tell him what we're going to do. And it was the first time I've ever talked to a city official where the city official gave me his resume. He started telling me, I'm working with this one, I'm working with that one. I got all the connections. I got everything that you need. We need victory outreach. We need a ministry like this. Come on, somebody. We heard the cry. Every realtor we talked to, we told them, we want to come in and open a rehab. And they kind of gave us a sideways look because there's hundreds of rehabs out there. But I said, we're different. We're not going to charge them to come in. We're totally faith-based. We're going to let them come in for free. And they said, our respect for you has gone to a whole different level. The city is crying out. But where is the man with the message? Where is the woman that's been anointed by God to go into these dark places? Are you in this place today? Where are those people who could see? I remember one night I just had to stay in the room and, and I said, I'm not going to go out to eat with you guys. Because, you know, pastors, they love to eat. And I'm on a diet anyways. I had two biscuits over there. I couldn't resist. And I stood in and. You know, I was just praying and getting along with God and trying to process everything that's going on. And I heard the voice of the Lord. And, and this is what God said. Because I said, God, I see the cry. I see the pain. I see the hurt. But what do you want to do? And this is what the Lord spoke to me clear. And this is what God wants to say to some of you this morning. He says, I want to give those people back their purpose. 
Because any one of you who has been delivered by the power of God, you walked in because you knew you needed deliverance. But once you got here a little while, you knew it wasn't about deliverance. You knew it was about God giving you a vision and God giving you a purpose and God giving you a destiny. Am I in the right church this morning? Is there anybody that got their vision back? Anybody that got their sight back this morning? God told me I'm going to take these men and women who've been bound and I'm going to give them their sight back. I'm going to fill them with vision. And I could see us creating a model there in Dayton, in Columbus, in Cincinnati that's not going to stay there. I believe we're going to create something there for the Lord that's going to go into Louisville, Kentucky. It's going to go into Indianapolis. It's going to go into Memphis, Tennessee. It's going to go even into New York City. How many know God has called us to reach the strategic cities of the world? Some of you need to let your heart grow. Some of you need to expand your spirit. It's bigger than us. It's bigger than San Diego. It's bigger than California. We're going to reach our own country for Jesus. And that's the third thing Jesus came to do. Are you with me so far? To preach liberty to those who are held captive. See, it's going to be those guys and girls that get set free that God's going to give them a message. And they're going to go out just like you and I. That's why I'm so proud of you. I, I love you. I'm so proud of you because you guys don't stop. You still have a heart for the sinner, a heart for the drug addict, a heart for the broken, a heart for the down and outer and the up and outer. We're a church with heart. How many can say amen? How many can give God praise? We know that Jesus came to set the captive free, to open up prison doors. See, Jesus came to free us from our past mistakes. And we walk as free men today. How many know it feels good to be free? It feels good not to walk in condemnation, walk in fear, walk, walk in anger, walk in bitterness. How many know it feels good to be free? And Jesus set us free. Jesus is the one who set us free. We're liberated from our past hurts and pains. We're free from sins that we committed to others and to ourselves. And sins also that have been committed against us. We've been hurt. We've been hurt. We've been done wrong. We've been slighted. We've been mistreated. But Jesus says, you don't got to hold on to it no more. He says, I I've set the captive free. You're not a slave to bitterness. You're not a slave to pain. You're not a slave to hurt. Sin can't hold us without our permission. Sin can't hold us. Unless we decide to sin, sin can't hold us. And then the fourth thing Jesus preaches, he preached the acceptable day of the Lord. What is the acceptable day of the Lord according to this scripture I read? I want to tell you, it's something called jubilee. Everybody say jubilee. In Israel, Jubilee took place every 50 years. And when Jesus said he was preaching the acceptable day of the Lord, what he was saying is that Jubilee is coming. Jubilee is coming to God's people. There will be a day where all debts will be canceled. During Jubilee, that's when anyone who is in debt to someone, that that debt was canceled and forgiven once and for all. Slaves were set free from their masters. Everyone in the nation, every person in the nation was given a brand new start. See, what would, wouldn't that be wonderful if, if, if the bank called you? Come on, say amen. Wouldn't that be wonderful if the bank called you and says, you know what, we've wiped out all your debt. We're starting over. Can I hear an amen? That's right. That would be your response. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the doctor came and said, you know what, you're totally healed. You're 100% healed by the power of God. Wouldn't it be wonderful if every enemy of yours came to you and said, you know what, man, I was the one that was wrong. I forgive you. I forgive you what, of what took place. What would you do? What would you do if God set you free? That's why I think if you come to church, you should never come to church dead. A dead church doesn't preach freedom. A dead church doesn't preach jubilee. A dead church doesn't preach a gospel that sets the captive free. But how many know we've been set free by the power of God? Come on, how many know we've been set free by the power of the Holy Ghost? 
And when he set us free, we've got a reason to shout. We've got a reason to rejoice. We've got a reason to praise. We've got a reason to give. We've got a reason to leave. We've got a reason to do God's will. We've got a reason to preach. We've got a reason to get out in the street. I declare to you that this is a season where God wants to use anointed men and women of God. This is the time. Terry neighbor, this is the time. Jubilee is here now. Jubilee is here now. Jubilee is here now. It's here. It's right now. And this is the time for every man and woman of Victory Outreach San Diego to put on the mantle of an evangelist. All right, if you're religious, you won't say nothing. But I want to tell you, this is the time for every man and woman of Victory Outreach San Diego to put on the mantle of an evangelist, to get into the highways, get into the hedges. Let them know that there is hope. Let them know that there is an answer. Let them know that Jesus came to give them back their sight. Oh, come on and praise them right now as they come. To, come on and praise them as they come. Come on and praise them. We're going to go get some souls. We're going to go fishing. We're going to win people to Christ. We're going to win families. We're going to win young people. You know why? Someone say why. Because you've been anointed by God. Look at your neighbor tonight. Tell him you are anointed. Look at your second choice and tell him you are anointed. And you know what? That anointing is not so that you can keep it to yourself. That, that anointing oil that you have is not so you can pour it on yourself in the morning. That anointing oil that he has given you, he's given you a purpose. He wants you to go out and look for the blind. Look for the broken. Look for the mistreated. Look for the people that have been rejected. Look for the people that have lost their loved ones. Look for the people that are suffering. Listen, they might look like it on the outside. They might look good on the outside. They might drive a nice car. They might be wearing a suit. See, it's not always the people that you can tell. But just because they look like they have it together on the outside doesn't mean they're not broken on the inside. Come on, how many know those are the ones God has called us to reach? Those, those are the people that need purpose. Those are the people that need a purpose. They need a vision. They're hooked on drugs. They're hooked to alcohol. They have problems in their life. And Jesus says, you know what? I've called you to reach them. As I close this message this morning, did you get something? I'll tell you, it's so powerful because after Jesus said these things in the temple, the Bible says that he did something that sometimes we glaze over. The Bible says that he, he closed the book. He closed the book. Why did he close the book? Because he wanted everyone to know that if they served him, they would not see the terrible day of the Lord that is coming. How many know that day has been prophesied? In some cases, we are already in a season where terrible things are being released in the earth through government, through... See, we can't trust the government to do the right thing. That's why I've been preaching to you about the seven mountain mantle, the seven mountains of influence, because we can't trust people who don't have Jesus to do the right thing. But what would happen if God began to raise you up? What would happen, watch, if you took the lead in the family? What would happen if you took the lead in the church? What would happen if you took the lead in that business? What would happen if you took the lead in education, took the lead in government, took the lead in media, took the lead in science and technology? What would happen if you took the lead and the spirit, oh, this is good, and the spirit of the Lord was upon you? What would happen? Clap if you know what I'm talking about. What would happen? We can get more people free. We can get more people blessed. We 
can see more families come together. So I think we got to take it serious this morning. And if you say, Pastor, I'm that man, I'm that woman with that message. I'm that man or that woman. Whether you're serving the Lord fully or you're serving the Lord partially, I want you to come to this altar right now. And I, I believe God is going to touch you and he's going to pour out his spirit in your life in a new way. He wants to anoint you. He wants to empower you. Let's sing that song. Stop playing games with the Lord. He has a plan for you. A purpose for you. He wants to use you in a mighty way. Let him anoint you. Let him use you. Let him give you your sight back. Let him give, him, give you your vision back. Let him give you that vision back. Say, Lord, I need that vision. Come on, lift those hands. He's giving you a burden this morning. You're a man with a message. You're a woman with a message. Don't give up. Don't give up, brothers. Don't give up, sisters. Keep on preaching. Keep on discipling. Keep on winning souls. Don't throw in the towel. Don't stop using your gift. Don't get bitter with God. He's using you. He's anointed you. He's empowered you. He's given you a purpose, a destiny, a calling. I feel the Lord in this place. He's going to use it to be a bondage break. You're going to break bondages when you're under the anointing. The power of God is going to move through you. The anointing. Can you hear the cry? Can you hear the cry? I feel the Lord. Come on, music team, don't give up. Stay in the battle, stay in the fight. You're leading us. their hands right now what would happen if we let the Lord break us what would happen if we let the Lord give us a stronger vision restore our sight some of you haven't been effective because you've been in a blurry vision or you've been discouraged and you've allowed temptations and diversions to take you away from God's vision in your life but what would happen if we were broken over the people God's called us to reach I want you to start visualizing that right now. I want you to begin. When's the last time you won a soul? When's the last time you ministered with power to somebody? I know you minister. I know many of you minister. But when was the last time you really broke for that situation? God says, I want to give you a brokenness over those people. We need leaders who are broken and leaders are visualizing change, not only in their life, in the lives of others. There's no greater joy than to see others change. There's no greater joy than to see lives transformed. There's no greater joy than to see families restored, people set free. Come on right now, I want you to begin to visualize it happening through you. Visualize it happening through you right now. Say, God, use me. Use me, Lord. Use my life, oh God. Use my life in a mighty way. Use my life.